So just picture with me for a moment that there's war in heaven. So heaven, we always think, just harmonious. The vibes in heaven, the harmony, the, the chords of, of love just resonating in heaven. And then it's broken. And then there's war. Now, war is like the opposite. There's tension. There's hatred. There's enmity. There's violence. And so there's this in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And so there was like this division. It wasn't just one, one lone wolf coming up and challenging God and who he was and, and pr- projecting their own perversion onto God as, you know, of his character. It wasn't just one. It was, it was spread and there were multiple angels which were created beings who loved God. They all went... Oh, perhaps God is, perhaps God is selfish, and we're just in this service bubble, and and He's just manipulating us. And so there's this lie, the father of lies, the Bible says, pervades the minds of His crea- created beings, and and now this the vibe in heaven, the 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 harmony, the chords that would would just complementary to each other were antagonistic to each other. It was like clanking. You know, when you get the piano and it's all the wrong chords, it's like, oh, that's what heaven was like. There was this war, tension between thoughts and feelings. And, and, and so there would have been angels now looking at God or Christ. And it's interesting, the position of Christ as the chief of all the angels and it indicates that he seemed to mingle with the angels as one of them, even though he was God of all. Like he was, he was, he was the word, you know. But, but yet he's, he, he likes to identify with his creatures as, as one and he likes the companionship and the friendship. He likes that. But now he's like, you know, we're friends. And, and the other's like, well, I don't trust you. I think you're... I think you're selfish. God's like, I'm not. But how can a selfish person defend himself? Because, I mean, someone who's claimed to be selfish, because you say, well, I'm not, and I'm going to show you that I'm not by hurting you all. Well, that kind of proves that he is. Yeah, and and God's, God's got in the pipeline this, this creation that, that we understand is this, crowning work of his creation like he's gonna he's got these plans to create an environment and and creatures within this environment where their their level of communication and their level of in integration is godlike it's like and so that's that's where we that's where we come into the picture. He 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 had plans to make man, to make the earth. And Satan, Lucifer was kept out of these plans, and and that actually upset him more. But if you just picture that heaven is there's tension in heaven, there's war in heaven. And and God's like, I want to create creatures who are who understand what it's like to have someone in their own image. I want to create a, a creature that, that knows what two becoming one intimately is like and what that results in. And, and so he made our world. And I, I think it's important for us to understand that when God made us, it, there was so much care and detail care to detail, care for purpose, that we, I, don't think, I don't think we appreciate how God values us. I mean, we go, yeah, God's love, God loves us, God loves everyone, that's just God, he loves it. But there's this like level of relational capability that he put into us that would has the potential to exceed the relationship that he has with the angels. In other words, the angels would help us get to know God into a 
into an intimacy that the angels themselves can't even know. That, like another level. And, and sure, they're willing. God's, God's angels, are, they're willing, they serve, and they have this, this spirit of self-sacrifice, and they go, you know, we're going to help these humans connect with God into a deeper relationship than we can even know. So this is the level of, of care and this is the whole purpose of, of this creation. And, and then he creates the world, as we know, the creation week, amazing. And as he goes through, he, he keeps pronouncing. What did, what did he keep pronouncing about this world? Good. It was good. You know, this is, this is the, the God of good. And he's like, this is good. Yeah, there's levels of good, but this is good. And did he just say good? Very good. Oh, very good. This is very good. This is like... And so he made man. And I, I picture, some, you know, him making Adam. He formed Adam out of, the, out of the ground and he's making... You know, I'm thinking of when he makes his brain and forms the head and is like... I'm going to build into this being space. A room inside the brain. There's going to be a compartment that can house me where I can fit into it, but only if they want. I want to have a room in them. And so he makes a being with a room for someone else, not you. And so he makes Adam and, and he communes with Adam and there is this beautiful harmony. You know, the vibes, the vibes are going again, you know. He's, this creation, Adam and Eve, he sees their relationship. He inter- interacts with this relationship. And I'll, let's open our Bibles to Exodus, um, Exodus 31. Have a look at this text. And here we um, see this picture <clears throat> talking about the Sabbath, this, the Sabbath day. So at the end of the creation week, he, he saw that everything he had made was good and the heavens and the earth were finished. And on the seventh day, he blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it. He's like, but notice in in verse 17, Exodus 31, verse 17, talking about the Sabbath, you notice verse 15 through to 16, context, six days, may your work be done. But but verse 17 is the one I want to read. It It is, the Sabbath is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day, he, who rested? God rested. And what? And what? And God was refreshed. God was refreshed. And I think, wow, why is God refreshed? But think about this. There's war in heaven. There's tension. There's, there's a lack of harmony within the heavenly courts. There's accusation. There's lies. There's... There's just the coldness. You know, there's the elephant in the room where it's just like something's wrong. There's no harmony anymore. He creates man. He makes man with the capability to relate and to have love and to commune with each other, but with him. And and it's like in this, and, and, and there's a room in man, you know. Know you not that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? Paul writes this in, in Corinthians. He says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? A temple is a room where God would dwell. And we've read in the Sabbath school lesson, does God dwell in the temples made with hands? I mean, you brick up a room, is God going to dwell in that? You're going to brick, brick up? We built this, not me, but the church was built. Does God dwell in this church? The Bible says that he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Talking of human 
edifices or human rooms, there's a room in you. And yes, God dwells in here because he dwells in you. That's why. That's why he's here. If two or three are gathered in my name, there I am where? In the the room, in your room. That's where he is. He's there. And whether you're in this building, which God bless this building here, represents that to the community around. And they're good. It's good to have church. But if you're out out in the bush and there were two or three gathered, would it also be the place where God would meet? Yeah, because it's your room that he's there. He created this room. And so he, he's got war in heaven. There's this tension going on. He comes to earth, beautiful, very good environmental bubble that he's created. And he communes now without fighting, without war. Can you see a little bit of picture of why God would be refreshed with that? Oh, this is refreshing. I'm refreshed to the fact that I'm with beings that aren't resisting me, that aren't looking at me sideways, that aren't saying, yeah, you're really, you know, for your own good and and accusation and blame. You know, you've been in a house where there's just flat out accusation and blame. You like that vibe? Ah, you just think this is tiring. (laughs) But you go to a home where it's just the vibe is nice. It's calming and you feel refreshed. It's not that God got tired in creation. He wasn't like, whew, that puffed me out. God wasn't getting tired. But the emotional drain of a war in heaven, he creates man. He comes and dwells with us in his little, in the room in that he built in Adam and Eve. And, and he comes, you know, the spirit of God, you know, it's a little bit hard to understand because while ever Jesus in his physical form is there, the Bible says he inhabits eternity, you know. How do you inhabit eternity? And it is through the Holy Ghost that he, he can inhabit eternity, all, all time, all place. So, but he, he's in, he's now, the Spirit of God is in Adam. He breathed into Adam the breath of life and there was this communion. And look, have a, jump over to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Have a look at this text, Genesis 3 and verse 8. Look at this. Look at this verse. And they heard the voice. This is Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And they, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam. And said unto him, where are you? Where art thou? (laughs) So he comes down. It seems to be like what he did, you know, cool of the day at a certain time of the day. Obviously wasn't the Sabbath on this particular day because the Sabbath was when he rested and he he had the whole day with man. But in this instance, it seems like they're working, Adam and Eve are doing their thing. And now he comes at a portion of the day to really connect in a deeper way, you know, in a very personal way. And so the the temperature dropped in the cool of the day. He turns up and and they're not there where they probably would have normally met. And so he calls, where are you? And now the vibe's broken. Can you see the the relationship, that harm, the the strings of harmony between the, the souls, that emotional connection they had was broken. And they were afraid of him. And they hid themselves. They were shameful. And then the story goes on. They started blaming God. Lord, the the woman you made, you gave to me. She, you know, and blame this and blame that. And there it goes. That war that was in heaven. And you think of the heart of God. He's like, I just want a relationship. And they just all hate. They just... They just all don't trust. There's not the, the, how do you deal with that? With, as, as someone who, who values individual freedom higher than his own life. You know, it's a line he won't cross, your individual freedom. Satan doesn't care. He'll bombard you. He'll possess you. 
He doesn't care one bit about you. But God certainly does. And he says, you know what, I created space for you. That's your space. You've got dominion over that space, but certainly built for me. You want to let God into that space. And so there was something lost. That, that room that he was inhabited in Adam and Eve, this temple of the Holy Ghost, was emptied. And someone else took over. And why I'm sharing this is because this has to do with Sabbath keeping. The Sabbath, whose, whose rest is it? Is it man's rest or God's rest? Question. Whose rest? Man's rest. It's not God's rest? <laughs> Get it? The rest of all of us and God. Hey? The rest of all of us and God. Okay, so Hebrews chapter 4 says categorically that it is God's rest. It's something that they would enter into, God's rest. But then he also says that it was made for mankind. And so we have this rest and it, it is something that, that God has and he imparts it to us. And the Sabbath is a sign of that. It's a sign because he created man and he rested and he was refreshed. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66. And notice the language here in this verse about God's character. Isaiah 66. Have a look. Beautiful text. Big insights into God's character, into, into what he's thinking and what, he, what he's longing for here in Isaiah 66. Starting in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord. The heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Big statement. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Then it says, here's a question. Where is the house that you built under me? And then here's another question. And where is the place of what? Of my rest. For all those things hath my hand made, and all those things hath been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. As in has this deep respect and, and belief in the, the veracity of what God has to say. So think of this, he's saying, I made everything. I inhabit eternity. Heaven's my throne. Earth is my footstool. But he's got an issue. He's saying, where is the house? You know the house that he made in Adam and Eve, that room? He says, where is that? And that room, we, we, we garnish. We, we make it our own, like our characters. Your, your mind is, is a gift from God. And you, you get to choose what you do with your mind. And so he's like, where is the, this, this house that you've built unto me? And then the question is, where is the place of what? Of my rest. In creation, before there was sin, in, a, in, an, in an environment where there was war in heaven, he created man, he spent time in that room with a deep communion and he was refreshed at the harmony, the love and it was, it was refreshing. It was a refreshment. And now the question is, fall, the fall has happened and he's saying, look, I do own everything. Yes, I have everything. But where is the place of my rest? Have a look at a, a, a passage in, in Matthew that Jesus spoke about. Matthew chapter 12. Jump over there and have a look at this. You know, Jesus, Jesus is spending his time actually in this passage uh, speaking to the Jewish leaders, actually, the church. And, um, and the context is, is, is actually how stiff-necked these people are. Notice here in, in Matthew 12. So Matthew 12 and 43.
Verse 43, and when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking what? Rest. Seeking rest and he what? He finds none. Okay, so just think of this. The spirit, so we've got a room inside of us that can house a spirit. God is a spirit. It was actually built for him. But the evil spirits also would inhabit humans. Who's in your house? Yeah, you're there. Yeah, we all know that. We're all there. We're all in our own house. But there's a room in there for someone else. Who's in it? And he's saying that when it's... And this is talking about, you know, when you've released and you've, and you've um, been freed, it says that the devils will go out and they're looking for rest and they find none. And then it says in verse 44, then he says, I will return to my house from whence I came out and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. So the evil spirits out of man going, oh, I want to inhabit another human, another being, because they also enjoy social. And so they're, they're looking and they don't find anyone. And so they're like, well, let's go back to the person that we came from. And they look in the window and it's empty. The room's empty. The, it's, and it's interesting language. They were looking for what? Rest. That's strange. And they didn't find any. But I'm going to go back and he finds it empty, swept and garnished. Then verse 45, and then he goeth and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. This dwelling, you know, that's their, their abiding in this place and the last state of the man is worse than the first even so even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation and he's talking to his church so we've got a problem Laodicea do you know what our problem is in the light of this text where there is an empty room that is built for the spiritual realm. This empty room, unfortunately, being the Jewish house, was inhabited by a spirit that, that, caused, that causes so much damage in our world. It co- it's, it's the source of the of all the bad vibes in our world, all the tension, the discord, the fighting between husbands and wives, between children, brothers and sisters, nations even, it doesn't really matter. The tension comes from the houses all being filled with those who did that in heaven. Have a look in, in, in Revelation chapter 3. This is our problem, church. Revelation 3. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Revelation 3. And verse 20. Revelation 3 and verse 20. If Jesus was to preach a sermon, would you be interested to hear it? Would you, you know, if you knew the guest speaker at the next... Easter camp, Jesus Christ. Would you be there? I reckon he'd be preaching this. I really do. I think if he had anything to say to our church, this is what it would be. Do you know why? Why I think that? It's because that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what he has to say to our church. He has this to say. He says, behold, as in consider this, think about this, I stand at the door and knock. What he's saying is, I'm not in your house. I'm not in the room. Yes, I'm with you, but I'm not there. His, this is the question in Isaiah. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. I own everything. But where is the place of my rest? The being who sanctified and made holy the Sabbath, who said, this is a gift 
Before sin ever entered into the world, it's a gift of relation, relationship, relational harmony in which the Sabbath is a sign of. And it represents me supping with you and a communion, an a, a interaction, an exchange between hearts. You know, like our prayer, our prayer life should be, sometimes it's hard to pray, but it's okay if you don't know what to say because prayer is about, prayer is about feeling the heart of God. Knowing his sufferings, knowing his purpose, his will, his everything about him. And if you just commune with him and you get a sense of, of what type of being he is, you will, you will, you will love him. There's, there's no, you, if you touch the heart of God and you start to realise the pain and suffering that he's, he's been through, it makes us just, well, we haven't suffered at all. Really, you know, and so he's wanting this. His God is social. He's wanting to interact with us, and he is the source of all our success in every other social endeavor. And here he says to the church, "I stand at the door and I'm knocking." Do you know what ties God? So he gets refreshed by communion, by a Sabbath with his people dwelling in, in us by our will to let him in. He's refreshed by that. But you know what also is not refreshing for God? When we resist. When we become stiff-necked and stubborn and just wanting it our own way all the time, that tires God out. Have a look in Genesis. Jump over to Genesis chapter 6. Have a look at the language here because this is just a picture of where we're at today. Have a look at... Genesis chapter 6. Verse 5. It says, and it, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it, what? It grieved him. Whereabouts? At his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man for whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowl of the air, for it repents me that I have made them. Jump down to verse 13. Have a look at this. And the Lord and God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. What's he saying? The the selfishness that pervades humanity has developed so much that violence had filled the whole earth. You think of your own home. Is it, is it like the place where you can relax a little bit? You know, you've been out, you go out and you do your business, you do your work, you fight in life just to get it. You know, you're just rubbing shoulders with, the, with people in the world and then you come home and it's like... No place like home. Maybe some people don't have that privilege, that blessing. Maybe they come home and it's just more and more tension. Maybe, maybe there's people that just have no place where they find rest. There's no place that's nice. This, at this point in Earth's history, the whole Earth was filled with violence. You go home, you lock those doors because you don't lock those doors. You don't know what's going to happen. And there's this, you're on edge. Someone break in, cut your throat, do whatever. And, and, and it's just spoiled all your peace and it's left. And this world is turning more and more like that. There's more and more <laughs> violence and just intent to hurt you. Scams everywhere. People just want to rip you off. Our world is getting filled like this. Notice in verse 3, verse 3 of, of Genesis 6. I don't think we read that in order, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. Verse, verse 3, and the Lord said, My spirit shall not always what? Strive. Strive with man, for he also is flesh. You see this word strive. What does it conjure up in your mind? 
God's trying to influence man into a, into a peaceful interchange with their neighbours, peaceful with God themselves, because man is not just at enmity with each other. The source of our tension between each other is actually the lack of unity with God. That's where it comes from. And so God is trying to woo man to strive to, to, to allow them to open up, allow him to enter the room. And he's saying, I'm not always going to strive with man. And this is a true statement. Even to the church of Laodicea, God will not always strive to enter into your home, your mental home. He won't. There'll get a time where the promptings of his spirit will get less and less and less. Have a look at Matthew 23. This is pretty stark, this one. I was thinking about this. I thought, you know, Jesus Jesus let the Pharisees have it, the church leaders have it in his day. Were the, were the, were the church leaders in his day, did they keep the Sabbath? They observed the Sabbath as their religious day of worship, certainly did. But they didn't keep the Sabbath. Because Sabbath keeping is about having your home occupied, that that room that was created, occupied by the creator where he would come in and feel refreshed with you. When Jesus was on earth, which home did he enjoy dwelling with? Did he have a like favourite place that he could just relax? Lazarus's place. He liked to dwell there. Why? Was he always fighting with you know, people coming up and trying to trick him or trying to get him to say things that, are, that they could use against him and just, they were just wolves always just attacking Jesus. And it, it, it was tiring, mentally tiring, just emotionally tiring. And so he would go to Lazarus's place, Mary and Martha, and, and there was just love. Just loved it. Does he have that with you? Does he come into your home, into your being, and go, I like being with. There's no resistance. You know, there's no pushback all the time. They're not trying to get me. I'm just enjoying my creation as I always intended. I'll bless them. They bless me. And there's this like beautiful harmony. And he liked that home. But have a look here at, at the church. It was hard work with the church. And I don't believe it's any different today. I think God strives with our church like he did in the days of old. I think we're as stiff-necked as they were. And uh, it says here in Matthew 23. So he's, he's pretty much laying out the woes to the Pharisees in this chapter, if you want to read it all. And he, he lets it loose. And it's not that he hates them. It's just that he hates the resistance, the, the, the religious pretense. Yeah, I'm good. When you're not good, you, you know, you can look good up front of church, go home and have a mess of a home, yelling at your kids, hating, hating everyone, blaming. And there's, there's no harmony at home and yet have a pious religious life. God doesn't like that. It's hypocrisy. It's like you're white, whitewashed sepulchres. You're white on the outside, but inside it's all dead men's bones. There's like death in there. And he challenges them. And so he, he concludes this this long rebuke to the church. And then you can see the tenderness of his whole motive of why he rebukes. As many as I love, he says in another place, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And so this is a rebuke. And was it built out of love? Certainly was, because you see verse 37, Matthew 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that kills the prophets and stones them that are sent unto thee. How often, notice this, how often, certainly at least once a week, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen that gathereth her children under her wings? And what's the response? And you would not. You wouldn't. The resistance we resist God for multiple reasons, but yet we can still be religious. And it's interesting how that works. And that is, 
we use religion to feed our ego that we are correct. I think everyone wants to be right, don't they? I think everyone would like eternal life, wouldn't they? And so we can fall into religion for this purpose of saying, I can gain eternal life. I can gain the sense of being correct. But I don't want Jesus to come too close into my heart because he's a threat to me, because I'll lose control of myself. I'll lose the reins. And so we, we can have this religious shell and yet our house is empty. Because notice the next verse. Verily I say unto you, uh, sorry, <clears throat> verse 38. You would not. Behold, your what? Your house is left unto you what? Empty. And what other spirits looking around for empty houses? Evil spirits are looking for their rest, even though it's not rest. They want to hop in the, the mental room of humans. They'll jump in and say, here we are. And, and you know, we kill the prophets. Sure, we go, well, we don't kill the prophets. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes we treat the spirit of prophecy with despite, with, with contempt. We don't appreciate what it says. You know, I was thinking about the young people, about some of the counsels we're given, you know, and nice testimony about, you know, not eating fish because you think, well, you know, there's, you, could, you could give a lot of reasons why it's, it's okay to, to eat flesh. But when you look at the spirit of prophecy, it's very clear that we should, uh, we should certainly look after our health. We should certainly put away things that have become more and more toxic in this world. We should, we should care for our temples, make them healthy because God dwells there. Not that making them healthy gives us salvation, but it's who occupies your heart that gives you salvation. Does it make sense? And you want to, you want to, but how many, how many times does our churches ridicule it? And yet people in the world would even understand that, that, the lifestyle that is clearly shown in this prophecy is actually light years ahead of, of what even science knows. And yet as a church, we're like, oh, no, that's just... And we, we treat it like rubbish. We treat the spirit prophecy like an inconvenient rubbish. And so in a sense, yeah, we kill the prophets too. You know, anything that doesn't fit, fit with how we're feeling... Have a, look at, have a look at another text. Let's think about Stephen. Anyone, anyone read Stephen's sermon lately? The young deacon? The young deacon that got killed? And I was thinking, I wonder what he was actually saying that upset them so much. Do you know what he said to them? And that really rolled them up. And the apostle Paul was there. And I tell you, that sermon must have started something in that apostle. I'm sure it did. And it, and it started brewing in him and it ultimately led to his conversion. Acts chapter 7. Have a look at the Bible, what the Bible says about this. Talking about wanting to build God a house. This is the context. David was wanting to build the house. But verse, verse um, <clears throat> 47 says, But Solomon built him a house. Were the Jews proud of the house? Oh, the Jews. You know, we can become really proud at the brand of Seventh-day Adventist. It's like an amazing brand around the world, millions of followers. And it's like the Jews were proud of the house that Solomon built it's like it was everything to them but notice what notice the the thrust of Stephen's sermon he says this verse 48 how be it the most high dwells not in ta in temples made with hands as saith the prophet heaven is my throne the earth is my footstool what house will ye build me saith the lord or what is the place of my rest Hath not my hand made all these things? 
What's he getting at? And then he says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always what? Resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. You see what he's getting at? He's saying, you're looking at building a house, building a church, doing all this, when you, we, us, are God's house. He, he finds rest in smooth, what's the word for no resistance? Like harmonious relation. He finds that refreshing in a world of war. And, he, and then he looks to his people, you're, you're stiff necked, uncircumcised of heart, always resist the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, who should we be resisting? Resist the devil and he will flee. But here the picture is, no, we're resisting God. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted and they have slain them that showed, <clears throat> that showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers? Who hath received the law uh, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and have not kept it. When they have heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed upon him with their teeth. And he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly unto heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right, right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And they went on and stoned him. What was he preaching to them? He was saying to them, your resistance, your hypocrisy, your religious framework has been the very thing that's denied you the presence of God. That's what he said. And then we read to the message in Laodicea, Christ is saying, yeah, you think you're rich Increase with goods. What are the goods we have as a church? We have the same thing the Jews had, the dispensation of the law given by angels. We have given the writings of the prophet. We have been given so much knowledge. And we have, we have all this. And then we take it that we think we're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And we don't know that we're poor, miserable, blind, wretched, and naked. And then he says, behold, I'm standing at the door. The person with the gold, with the ice cell, with the raiment is standing at the door. Everything you need for a happy life is found in Jesus Christ. And he's at the door. He's not in. How can you gain that blessing? And then Hebrews chapter 4. Powerful, powerful... Um, passage about the Jews, how he says, you will not enter into my rest. He says, yes, there remaineth a rest for the people of God. The Sabbath day is still the sign. It's the sign between us and God. It's this, it's this place in time that he would like to meet us. Where would you like to meet? I want to meet at the place in time. And that is the Sabbath hours. He wants, he wants there to be this time of of feeling refreshed. He wants you to be refreshed. The only way you can be at rest is if we come to him and we say, Lord, this week I've been really hurt. My heart's aching. I've had this at work. I've had this in my home. I've had this against my family or something's happened and, and my heart is hurting. You know, I've loved somebody and they've never loved me back. How, is that, isn't that not nice? Have you ever loved somebody and they just didn't love you back? You know, and it just hurts. And you're like this... It's not pleasurable. And then Jesus comes and says, you know, we're going we're gonna to have a Sabbath together. And you just open the Sabbath and just pour your heart out to him. And he says, I feel that too. You know, I, I love you guys and you won't love me back. You know, we're so stiff necked trying to do our own thing. Yeah, get wealthy, get rich, get power, get money, get lust, whatever. You know, we're all just pursuing selfish interest. But it's the very thing that creates the discord. It's what created the discord in heaven. And it's what will create the discord in your very own home. It's no different. And the Sabbath is a sign. 
You can't keep the Sabbath just by turning up to church every week. It's no different to the Jews. But the reality is the Jews never kept the Sabbath. They didn't. I mean, sure, individuals did. But I'm saying as a nation, their house was left desolate. It was empty. You know, he says, to what type of person does, what type of person is it that doesn't have the resistance? You know, they're always resisting the Holy Ghost. What type of person doesn't resist? It said it it in the text when he says, where is the place of my rest? All things my has have, have been made and has have been. But then he says, but to this person will I look. To him that is contrite. That is poor in spirit. It's just when the light of sin realizes how they've always been. It's not that God makes you feel poor so that you need him. You already are poor. He's just making you realize that. That's all. It's a truth of dependence oh without him i'm helpless yes we are helpless without him acknowledge it and your resistance will go away that proud heart will just start melting you know he's he said that to pharaoh you know he was at pharaoh saying let my people go and he showed him amazing things and pharaoh's mind's like yeah yeah okay i'll let him go and then no no i'm not gonna let him go and he just kept resisting and resisting And resisting until Pharaoh died. Because he didn't acknowledge that proud king wouldn't acknowledge that he needed God. But you look at the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, proud man. Probably just as proud as Pharaoh. And he had to go insane and realize there is nothing in this world outside of Christ's presence. It's nothing worth it. All you can have, the kingdom of Babylon, you can have every servant you can imagine, you can have all the wealth, everything. Just understand this. It's nothing without God. He says, why would you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? What does it profit a man? Thus saith the high and lofty one, another place says, who inhabits eternity, Who dwells with him? What does the Bible text say? I'm just trying to remember it. Thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell. Actually, just look it up. It's um, it's in Isaiah. Let's have a look it up. Isaiah, I'm sure it's 57. Just memory just slipped on me. Verse 15, yes. Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. You know, keep the Sabbath holy. How are you going to do that if you're not holy? You try and keep something clean when you're not clean. You can't. Thus saith the high and lofty one who whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place. What does it say? With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Take time to feel the heart of God. Feel your own heart. Feel your need. And you'll see that God's built us for a relationship that he allows himself to need. Think of that for a moment. God doesn't need anything. But he made us and then he's put himself in a vulnerable position to say, I need this relationship. It's meaningful to me. And that relationship is just to bless us at the end of the day. It's not to use us. And when you start to feel his need for relational love, And you start to reflect in your own life that you have a need. You'll start to be able to see the Sabbath in a new light. You'll start to see what true Sabbath keeping is. It's not a whole lot of legislative rules and regulations. It's about heart to heart. 
touching each other for 24 hours. And then through the week we go and we, we energise off that, plus still connection with God every day. But we have to live our life. We have to rub shoulders with the enemies of this world, of we, the, those who despise us and use us. And, and we have to learn to love like he loved. And so if we go through the work. We, we labour to enter into this rest. It's my prayer, brothers and sisters, that when we get to heaven, when we look at the eye of God, when we see his eyes, we'll have the vibe of just rapport and love because we already have it now. Amen.